everyone, and welcome to the Social Exchange Project, a podcast that provides extraordinary people with a platform to tell their story. This is your host, Shangler Waldinger. And this is Addie. And today's guest is the owner of Harp Entertainment and Healing, a professional harpist and music therapist, and most importantly, a friend who just recently celebrated a birthday. So welcome, Sarah Orr. Thank you. <laughs> so just to dive right in, um, I know in past conversations, you started out with the piano at a very young age. I think it was seven. Yes. How did you navigate into getting into the harp? And why was that your instrument of choice? So... Uh, so yeah, so I started playing piano when I was seven. Um, my mom tells me I asked to take lessons. There was no like prompting, like asking me if I wanted to play an instrument. Um, and so I just chose piano, I guess. Uh, so I took lessons seven through college, about like 23, 24. Um, and then also I played the viola fifth grade through about high school and then off and on throughout college. Do you still play the piano or the viola? Um, not really. I chose viola. I didn't choose viola necessarily. So my mom, I wanted to play violin. Sure. And my mom didn't want to hear me practice violin because it's very like screechy and sounds like cats are dying. <laughs> like it's not the prettiest <laughs> not sound. Not my house. Until you're like a professional <laughs> and you know how to play in tune. And she wanted me to play the cello and I didn't want to play the cello because it was like you know, a big instrument, um, and I was small, obviously, <laughs> so uh, we agreed on And the harp's not small, you guys. I the know, harp's... it's an interesting <laughs> point for you to be like, it was so big, and then you come lugging in something I taller know. than you. <laughs> I know, and then uh, I, we agreed on the viola, since it's like a little bit deeper than the violin, and sure. not as huge as the cello. So how did that transition to the harp? Um, so when I was in school, I went to school for music therapy, and so through that program, you have to learn every single instrument. Um, so like all the wind, woodwind instruments, guitar, stringed instruments, brass instruments. Um, and so harp was just one of the ones that was like highly recommended. Like it wasn't, you didn't have to take it. Um, but I decided to take a semester. And so then I took a semester of harp. Can I ask you, how did you choose your major and why was it important for you to have music incorporated with therapy? Because there is a helping component to that. So how did you come about choosing your major? So originally when I went to college, I was 18 and I originally went to Beloit College and I was going to be a piano performance major. Um, and then I left Beloit and when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, um, I wanted to do music therapy, I think partially just because I was good at instruments, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then also it was like more practical. So my mom didn't want me to do another performance major because you don't really make much money unless you're like a fucking child prodigy <laughs> or something, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which at 18, obviously I'm not. Um, and so <clears throat> I decided to go down like a more practical route. Originally, I was born in... Daegu, I want to say, which is in South Korea. Um, uh, and I was born either late uh, the 25th of December or very early on the 26th. You don't know your actual birthday. There's no record of like when I was born. Sure. I, I, I assume I wasn't born in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So there's no like record of when I was born. Um, and so my, I guess my, my mom didn't think, she didn't want me. And so I was placed on a doorstep uh, for bay, in a bay-colored blanket. And then somebody found me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, they looked for, like, relatives or someone to claim me, and no one claimed me. And so then, like, within the following week or so, I was um, brought to Seoul, which is the capital, basically, of South Korea. And then I was in an orphanage for, for eight or nine months. I mean, you speak about it so nonchalantly. <laughs> I, I assume it's nonchalant because you can't remember it. It's probably yeah. people have told you. I'm, I mean, I'm assuming you can't remember as a newborn. Um, so it, does it feel kind of like a disconnected part of yourself? Something that you're like, yeah, it's kind of ambiguous. I'm, I'm not really sure. I think like I also grew up always knowing I was adopted mm -hmm. and always like in white Green Bay, Wisconsin, 
So I that's guess, where I'm from, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's never like, especially when I was growing up, there was not a lot of diversity. Like there weren't a lot of blacks or Hispanics or Hmong people, and so like it was me and my brother. And um, so I guess I've also like told the story a lot. So it hasn't been like. Like, you're right. I was a newborn, so it's not like <laughs> I really remember being yeah. cold or placed on a doorstep. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like I was always, like, abandoned twice. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I will never know my parents, my adopted parent, or, sorry, my biological parents. And so, like, I can't really necessarily, like, fault them because I I don't know why they gave me up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, yeah. Um, and so with my biological parent, or, sorry, my adoptive parents, I... I wish sometimes that they could have uh, given me a little bit more attention, I guess. When you say that you felt like you were abandoned twice, what specifically are you regarding to or a specific instance that makes you feel abandonment from your adoptive parents? I just think that, like, parents are there to teach you about the world and to help, like, nurture help nurture you and not necessarily like put a roof over your head and clothes and feed you um i think i learned a lot about the world just through um success and mistakes mm -hmm. um and i wish that i had been given a little bit more attention i always like kind of tell people that have like that are parents that have like a more difficult child i'm like just remember your other kids too because mm -hmm. i mean naturally a, a troublesome child is going to require more work which is mm -hmm. fine so originally when i came back from teaching <coughs> in south korea i wanted to become like a paid musician and i knew i couldn't do that with piano because everyone plays piano um and so i decided to take up the harp again and so i found someone that would rent me the harp a harp and so i got the harp and then i just started practicing a little bit and then at the time, I worked at a nursing home. I worked at Severson. It's now, I think, closed. It's now closed, mm -hmm. and it's owned by apartments, I think, now. But anyways, I was in activities with at Severson. So I kind of got to, like, practice with the old people. Like, I kind of, like, got Because you like, still work with the elderly <laughs> population now. Not directly. I work, I'm an admin assistant, but at a nursing home. Gotcha. Sure. Um, and you, when you provide music therapy, we had talked earlier, and there was... A um, couple, God, like a month ago now, did we meet up originally? Um, you had told us about an event that I thought was really beautiful because you were playing the harp for an elderly individual while he was passing away in the moment. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Um, could you kind of talk about that? It gives me chills. It How gives do you me, like, even get into a yeah. business where you <laughs> play music for somebody who is passing? So I think just like working in that field, that's how I kind of just like, I just have access to people that are d dying, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. You know? Access. <laughs> they but they request <laughs> that though. Not oh, not usually. Okay. Because I mean, like, I, I think that typically like families and elderly like are a little like nervous of what music therapy might be. So I mean, um, now I kind of just find someone that I think either needs music or already has a connection with music or maybe doesn't go out for other activities very often. Um, and I just see if they are open to it, I guess. Sure. And so that experience that you were talking about, I was working at Grace Woodlands at the time. And there was this man there that I had, I think, played harp for maybe once or twice just in his room uh, before he was, I guess, an imminent death. And then he, like all of his siblings, or all of his sons and daughters were coming and kind of saying their goodbyes. And they he was waiting, I think, for his last and maybe youngest or oldest son, one of the two. And um, it was just that son and the man dying and myself in the room. And I was playing Danny Boy because he was Irish. Um, and as I played my last note, the man took his last breath. And so See, there it is. That's just there it is. Once again, that's in <laughs> incredible in in the way that you get to share somebody, a human being's last few breaths. Like how how do you take that in? How do, how do you, you even begin to fathom us? and process something like that? Um, I think I just I don't I don't know. Like I just do do it. I don't know <laughs> if I have a really good answer for that. I mean, I just enjoy like 
being like what goes through your head when something like that is happening i kind of think it as like not like a blessing but i'm glad that i could be there in some way for both the person passing and the family i mean i don't like oh, that doesn't happen that often that i'm playing as like they're dying it's just kind of calms me i guess and it's just sure. like a nice feeling that i can it would be so transitional and so beautifully that. transitional. I don't think I'll ever witness something like that in my life. Um, so I thank you for telling that story. I really, oh. really like that story. Are you working on anything at this time? Kind of. I so. see that you you did your first collaboration in November with a band. I saw that. Oh, it yeah. was like a live band. How did that go? That was kind of fun. So I had <laughs> um, gone to Mystic in Chippewa um, to their open mic. And yeah, it was just like playing some songs and there were some other musicians there. I think Fat Cigar, um, they were kind of like the house band oh. of that night. Mm -hmm. Jeff White hosts. And so then um, Yuliana was like, hey, hey, you want to play a song with me? <laughs> just Because I had never been in that experience either. Mm -hmm. They're like, sure. So and then Matt sales i want to say was on slide guitar mm -hmm. and so yeah we just all kind of uh listened a lot to each other because uh with harp being a little bit quieter um they had to kind of like change i think like their dynamic levels sure and i learned that i keep horrible horrible tempo <laughs> like, <laughs> like being a solo are you like most of my life like, like i don't really have to care about like uh, other people. Other people. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, because so you're like, oh, more of a solo yeah. artist. Right. So um, I was like, oh, yeah, I should work on that, that on that. So I've been uh, practicing with the metronome a little bit more, um, just so if those opportunities arise that it doesn't suck as bad. But it was really, like, fun <laughs> to be a part of something. What kinds of collaborations would you be interested in doing in your future? I am interested in anything that anything people... Anything and everything. Yes. <laughs> I guess I, I like to say yes a lot, and I'll just take, I think... Yeah, I'll just take things on. A I'm good experience to just try things out. Do you write your own music? Nope. Okay. Like I said before, I kind of hate my voice, and so oh. I don't really sing. So Would you, like, ever <laughs> compose your own harp piece? Would you ever do that? something like that? Yes, I want to. So mm -hmm. I have that electric acoustic harp, um, which I purchased in 2019. And so with that, I can, like, play around with effects pedals and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of want to play around with, with that. And then I'm also, future projects, I'm going to play in the Eau Claire Chamber Orchestra in March. Ooh. Nice. I'm scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> Actually trying to tear down the gig twice, but. Oh, stop. You tr what do you mean you tried? They were a little, she was a little persistent. So the manager <laughs> of the Eau Claire Chamber Orchestra, she has said that like, oh, like, um, the, this piece needs a harp, harpist. And I said, okay. I said, um, uh, I don't. If you can, like, show me the music. So, because I didn't want to, like, get in over my head and, like, say yes to something that, like, I, that and my you're not skills, for something like that, that my skills yeah. weren't up for. Because I've never played in an orchestra with harp. Um, so, like, orchestral harp music is much different than, like, mm -hmm. pop mm -hmm. yeah, music. And so, she's like, okay, well, we won't be able to get it to you until, like, six weeks before uh, we rehearse because of the expense of the rent rental of the music. So I said, uh, like, I, I don't really know. Like, I don't I don't think I can learn. How long does it take for you to learn a song? Or just does it depend on the song itself? So this orchestra music is 22 pages long. Ugh. Oh, gosh. So I, I, that's why I turned it two down. Two days. Two or three days tops. <laughs> so that's I was like, it. oh, I'm sorry. Like, you know, like six weeks, 22 pages. That's kind of a lot. No, thank you. Sure. And then um, like a week or so later, she was like, you know, I went to school to be like a professional pianist and you know I got this chance to perform with the orchestra and it was like it was awesome mm -hmm. you know and she's like I really think you should reconsider I said okay I'm like if you can get me the music um I'll take a look when you get it and I'll make my judgment then and she's like sure. okay so I assumed I would get the music six weeks before the first rehearsal which mm -hmm. is in March and so like two days later she has scanned me the heart part. The 22 pages <laughs> yes. show up in your inbox. <laughs> and you're like, crap, now I don't have that excuse. Yeah, so I look <laughs> at it and I'm like, the, I think this is doable. And so I I said yes and um, I found a teacher. So I will start taking lessons um, on the 11th of this month. 
And so I'm going to have the teacher kind of help me, guide me through orchestral music. So I do have to say, you have played a lot of our favorite songs. You do a lot of wonderful covers. Thank you. Is there a song that just speaks to you that you love performing? I have to say, it used to be Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen, but I have played that many times. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> because it is one of my favorites and mm-hmm. i think like i think it's everyone's favorite especially like open mic it's a universally beautiful yeah. and accepted song and so. like a lot of different bands and people have covered it so like my favorite cover is jeff buckley's cover um and then the Pentatonix have covered it which i think has kind of made it more accessible to uh the younger generations um and so yeah i think that's partially like why it's such a popular song. I think it was in Shrek to everyone. Oh, <laughs> heck yeah, yeah, it was I in think Shrek. <laughs> I think it's in everything. That is like yeah. a classic. So is that the song that you'll be performing today? Yes. yes. Upon request. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're, what <laughs> we're going to do. Popular Demand by Shang and Addy. Popular yeah. Demand. find that <laughs> playing for a wedding is very different from playing for church and and um how different is that from playing for yourself like at a bar yeah of course every setting and every like every setting is different so at a wedding i know like what's kind of helped like ease my nerves because no matter what setting i'm in there's always some nerves you there. have nerves that's insane yeah. never seen it i'm always like a little like oh shit i'm starting to sweat <laughs> I'm paying like 10,000 times. Okay. Um, <laughs> but anyways. So, yeah. So, like, a wedding, I've always said, like, I'm never going to be, like, the center of attention. And I never should be. I mean, like, that's the bride's day. And so, typically, also, like, I most wedding ceremonies are maybe a half hour max these days. And so, like, the amount of time that it takes a bride to walk down the aisle is maybe a minute. Mm-hmm. So, I'm never, like, usually, like, playing a full song. For weddings. Sure. So, I mean. What song do they normally request? I feel like. 
last year's song was Perfect by Ed Sheeran. Oh, yeah. The year before oh, yeah. that was Beauty and the Beast, the theme. Interesting. And when I first started doing weddings, it was uh, A Thousand Years by Christina Perry. Yes. Oh, of course. From Twilight. Yes. Yeah. That's uh. that's actually the go-to <laughs> wedding song now. Yeah. I like her Jar of Hearts song. That's oh, yeah. a nice one. Mm-hmm. You and your damn Jar of Hearts. Yeah. So in your repertoire, how many songs could you play from memory? None. <laughs> you always have to have something huh? yeah i mean i feel like i've asked this question too like uh-huh. in the music community there's like a lot of guitarists and singers songwriters like they don't use music mm-hmm. and so i'm like should i not be using music um but they're like anastasia was like you are doing more than just playing the yeah. four, same four chords over and over again like yeah. there's a little bit more that goes into like playing harp or piano from memory you embody the entire like all the notes like the backup notes and the main notes like i noticed that a lot about the music that you play because you even something as amazing as game of thrones which is what made me fall in love with you uh when i first met you was game of thrones that that theme song i always think of like the main notes but you do all the backup notes for it too yeah so you embody the entire song in a harp how how are the harp and the piano similar? Because they're, are they from the same music family? No, they're not. They're not? It's percussion and uh, strings. Yeah, so there's also like a lot right? of like um, debate on that, to be honest. But Because yes. in, in my head, they <laughs> and make... And Addie Jo Cuff In goes, my right? world, right, they go together they're they're cons- in my head they're constructed the same now you are professional at both so piano is a percussion screw me, isn't it but yes it is a percussion yeah. so because it like i guess in my head it's the combination of of chords and then the combination of keys is it comparable at all like did playing piano first help you be a better harp player i think like for sure so i mean having like essentially 18 years of playing piano i think it gave me a good base to learn you know any instrument but with piano, I mean, harp music is essentially piano music. Interesting. Oh, In what way? Interesting. That's weird that you're confirming Addie right now because her <laughs> ego just grows and grows. My ego is now through the roof. It was just, it was, it was tickling the she ceiling She can't get before. out of this room now. I know, so I can my head. Like any piece of harp music on the piano. So they're transformed. Verbal, if that's the right word like um i don't know if that's the right word no. it's not I, I can okay. tell you right now it's not the right word um, but they are the same. so how are they the same interchangeable so they use the same clef so they both use bass and treble clef um typically my piano pieces since my fingers because of my training can like move much faster mm-hmm. um usually a lot of that music was a little bit like more difficult in terms of like tempo and speed sure also, when you're playing the harp, depending on which harp, so pedal or lever, I own both. But um, you have to be changing pedals to change accidentals, so flats and sharps. So you have to be like moving your feet um, when you're playing. And I'm just not as good at that at the harp yet because I've only had that harp for a year. Um, so do you, do you still play piano? No. Do you want to? Not really. Do you think that desire might ever come back? So there's like one piece um, that has never been performed, but I fell in love with when I was at Beloit College. Um, It's like this Beethoven sonata. It's very fast. It's in F minor. And there are just like these beautiful melodies within it. And I've always like maybe thought that like somehow I'll do some kind of weird like mashup. I don't know if that's the right word either, but like loop something on the electric harp. And then, like, do something on the keyboard mm-hmm. so that, like, because that song is kind of, was, like, mm, like, I can make that song into, like, a new, but also, like, honor, like, what it was and what, like, I'd essentially be, like, leaving behind. So putting a little bit of Sarah Orr twist on it, I think yes. that that would be gorgeous. I don't know that piece by Beethoven. I know one piece by Beethoven. Old Ode to Joy. Oh. Even worse. You're, you're right. Yes. I know it because of the recorder from fourth grade. I want to actually totally switch gears now because uh, we're probably coming to the end of the this time. Yep. I want to know more about you. Is there anything else that you do, <laughs> hobbies or passions that you do aside from music and, and the harp that you work on or anything kind of cool that we can all learn about you? Uh, 
So obviously, like harp takes a lot of my life. Yeah. As does my nine to five job. Um, I have a husband. That's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married for Hashtag three years. Married. Uh, we'll I'm not coming up on our fourth in July. Um, I like to travel a lot. So when I was in Korea, I definitely got the travel bug. Um, with weddings and whatnot, I haven't like getting busier with weddings. I haven't mm-hmm. been able to travel as much. Where have you all traveled to? Tell us more about that. Uh, so I've traveled to Canada when I became a U.S. citizen in eighth grade, and then I, uh, when I was in Korea, I went to Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, the DMZ, if you want to consider that. So North Korea. Um, you were in North Korea. Yeah. I was on a DMZ tour. Okay, now I'm interested. Now I want to know before about Kim Jong Un. Now before we get into <laughs> Thailand, which is one of my favorite places to travel to, um, Chiang Mai, Thailand. How did you? What was the? What was the security like for North Korea? So it's like super high. Uh, like so, you get like a list of rules mm-hmm. um, before. You, so you have to like sign up with like a tour company. It's not like you can just like rent a vehicle and like drive to North Korea. Well, of course not. So you sign up with like a tour company and uh-huh. they have like a list of maybe like 20 rules, 15 rules. I say Give us it. a couple of those rules. I'd like to know if me and Annie could pass. I don't think you can take pictures. Can you take pictures? No, you can't take pictures, right? You can't take pictures at certain points, which is like a lot of the tour. You're not allowed to take pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, you also cannot wear like anything that's like revealing clothing wise. So like you're at you're at you're out. So like <laughs> I'm literally wearing basically pajamas today, <laughs> but I'm out. Um, so you don't like tempt the North Koreans, I guess, or like let them see. Oh, your you skin. temptress! You also have to wear closed-toed shoes, and it specifically says that you can run in. So in case you need to run, you can run. Uh, no, you're not. I'm fascinated. <laughs> that's kind of like a weird. <laughs> You should be signing a waiver if that's a rule, but, you know, um, they're saying it without saying it. You can't do any, like, obviously, like, hand motions, like, no hellos. No, no gang gangs, no. Right, nothing. Um, you're not allowed to be drunk. You're not allowed to be hungover when you show up. Like, How would they know? Well, they obviously, like, don't breathalyzer you, but, I mean, like, it's for your own safety and your best interest of yourself and the group that you're not drunk or hungover. I don't think I'd want to be drunk in North Korea. It's kind of like the tour was kind of eerie, but kind of like interesting at the same time. So how would you describe it in three words? Educational. (laughs) Educational. Okay. Like a little haunting. Because you know like what wrong things are happening there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, you know it's a facade almost. We know what point. they let us know, and what they let us know isn't chill, isn't right. great, but... And then I would say, like, it's a little sad, just because um, the South Koreans still have family in North Korea, and the North Koreans still have yeah. family in South Korea. There's a huge segregation still. And they still have, like, family members that, like, they miss and that they love, and there's, like, some fence or something that, like, South Koreans at one point tied, like wishes or like blessings or prayers or something on it's just kind of sad that like it's just so divided yeah and it's probably going to be divided for the foreseeable future yep i mean there's always talk of like unification which is like a hot topic in south korea Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah it's just sad so and then you also taught in south korea correct yeah what did you teach over there I taught English to third graders. Third grade Korean kids are like super cute. Did you have to know Korean in order to teach? No. I had a co-teacher. Okay. And then I taught fifth grade and then sixth graders. And I learned that sixth graders are the same as they are in America. <laughs> <laughs> in one way. Little shitty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. They think they're too cool for school. Because like they're at the top of their class. You yeah, know? that's a developmental <laughs> thing. It doesn't right. go away in all of us, but... And they uh, don't really like to behave or listen to the teacher. They're, like, into their own thing. Was so. that a really cool experience for you? Would you ever go back and do it again? No. <laughs> I would never go back again. I always tell people it was kind of like a learning experience. So my initial reason in choosing South Korea to teach in is because I am from South Korea, and I kind of wanted to get to know my culture mm-hmm. um, a little bit more. But the South Koreans didn't really like me. 
Um, and so they what do were, you mean they didn't yeah. like you? They were like mean to my face. So like the old ladies are called ajumas and the old men are called ajushis. And they would like look at me and they would give me like the Korean no. And also because like I had recently been in vacation in, uh, I don't remember where, but in South Korea, like I was very tan, which mm-hmm. you know in America is like great. And but so, there you have to be really pale white. That's the, right. that's the um, standard of beauty there. Yes, because like if you're tan, that means that you're poor and that yep. you're working. You work in the sun. In the fields. Interesting. So they hated me for that. Yeah. And then they hated me because I was too American and that I did not speak their language and I did not like love every food that they put in front of me. Um, did you so feel a connection going back to South Korea in any way, shape or form? Uh, that that was to some extent part of who you are as Sarah Orr? Not really. I always, like, tell people, like, I I feel that I experienced, like, reverse racism when I was in South Korea. So, like, here, people always notice that I'm not white first. And in South Korea, they, like, the Koreans, like, recognized that I was not a real South Korean. Um, that was too American. And so that was pointed out many times. The kids loved me and that they also, like, some of, like, some of the Koreans uh, thought I was beautiful. So, like, obviously their, like, beauty is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the kids always told me every day that I was beautiful, <laughs> oh. <laughs> which was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> but my co-teacher at the time who was, like, 40 and still living at home, I guess, like, to Korean standards, she probably wasn't as attractive as me. And, like, she would yell at me in, so- in Korean and then ask me in English, like, why I don't understand Korean. And it was, like, oh, yeah. horrible. Because, like, that's, that's how, like, how in, important beauty is and how, like, jealousy can show in mm-hmm. South Korea. Because, like, when you apply to a job, mm-hmm. you also put a headshot. Hmm. I would never put my face on my resume, <laughs> ever. I'm like, you see me when I walk through the door. That's more for, like, acting and stuff <laughs> here. In yeah. The, in America, yeah. Right? But that's interesting that yeah. there's such a heavy emphasis on how you look in the in the U.S. I think that's still here, but not in such blatant ways. Like when I'm applying to a job, I hope my bosses don't give a crap what I look like. But in right. Korea, you have to be like, yes, I'm cute, but also qualified. Right. That and would a lot be, of like yeah. kids get um, double eyelid surgery when they're in like yeah. middle school and high school because I mean their standard of beauty is like American. Pretty, yeah, is Western. Interesting. So let me ask you a question. How important is it for you to understand where you came from? And is it also important for you to know who your biological parents are? So I'm kind of, so my husband recently suggested, again, that I do a DNA test. Mm -hmm. He said, like, everyone's doing them all over the world. I originally had done, bought one. It's like a swab and you send it in the mail, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he suggested I do 23 and me and the other one that's out. Mm-hmm. And um, I've always been like nervous of doing one just because um, I've identified with being South Korean my whole life. Mm-hmm. And even when I was in Korea, people told me that I didn't look like full Korean, that I didn't look Korean. Mm-hmm. And my husband thinks I look a little Chinese. Uh, a do you, young, do you a feel like Chinese, like, you mentioned Chong. that you might be mixed or something potentially? Yeah, I do mean, I don't that? know, right? Okay. I, I don't know. You don't know. I don't know my biological parents. Um, but at the time, too, uh, babies, lots of, like, Korean women were either comfort women, uh, meaning, like, that the white American soldiers raped them, or um, the Korean women were having <coughs> sex with white men. And so, like, there is that potential that, like, I am s- something else besides, like, full Korean. Sure. Is it important for you to know? Uh, y- yes and no. I mean, I don't really need to know my biological parents. Unless, like, they want to know me, I guess. Like, there are those stories of people, like, knowing their biological parents. But I guess I'm not, like, to protect myself, I'm not really going to put, like, much thought into that. Because I sure. haven't known them my whole life. Um, and so, like, I think it would be cool to know where I'm from. It's just, like I said, like, a little scary. Because, like I said, I've assumed I was South Korean most of my life. Um, and so to know that I am something else, I think, would change at least something <laughs> your mentality like your or even how you perceive maybe right. yourself like, oh, should i go to china now <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, I definitely I think like want to figure that out. And also, Dan, my husband said that a lot of people find their relatives through these DNA tests now. Mm-hmm. So I think it'd be at least like cool and interesting to see like mm-hmm. if I have brothers and sisters or parents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You Good know. Point. 